Welcome to today's edition of Roland Rambles. <laughs> I have something that I want to talk about today that uh, I really wanted to talk about something else, but this is tangential to it, that they're kind of related. Um, I have recently purchased the entirety of the Apprentice Adept. It was originally a trilogy, now it's like a septology. There's seven books. Um, when I was in high school, I read three books because there were three. And I do recall that back then, um, yeah, there was a lot of descriptive stuff about nudity and sex in the books. Um, it's a, the series, just to be clear, it's by Piers Anthony. It's a combination sci-fi fantasy series. It bounces between a sci-fi world and a fantasy world. So you go between technology and magic. And I haven't read all of it, or even much at all as, as an adult. It was all, you know, 15, 16, 17 years of age. And of course, being in that age range and a male who likes women, I'm going to like things that men who like women, who are um, men who are youthful, teens, whatever, who like women are going to like. So, of course, descriptions of um, of almost perfect breasts that bounce in certain ways or whatever, of course that's going to be interesting to a friggin' 16-year-old boy. But I'm not a 16-year-old boy. The internet exists and has for a long time. There are boobies everywhere. You kind of can't avoid them. If, if you run a search for something simple, there's probably boobies begging you to come to OnlyFans and pay for them somewhere in the background, which is frankly kind of stupid and a little disgusting um, that so many women fall for that trap. But whatever, you know, you do you. I don't care. Ultimately, it's not my problem. I'm not one of the foolish simps paying for these women, and, uh, and I will never be. However, I will defend vigorously my choice in science fiction fantasy novels that have boobies in them. And that's what this is about today. But I'm not really prepared to talk about the novel aspect as much, because I only just read the first couple of chapters of the first book last night. Although, to be completely frank, that, that gave me plenty to work with. Today's subject is actually the term misogyny. And the fact that feminists, SJWs, leftists, woke tards, whatever you want to call them, have no idea what misogyny even is anymore. Um, a long, long time ago, maybe, maybe, and I am, I am giving massive benefit of the doubt here, a long, long time ago, misogyny might have actually been depicted accurately by feminists maybe in the 70s. I don't, I don't even know that that's true. But in order to avoid the definition problem, I'm going to give you a definition of misogyny that everyone should be able to agree on. Misogyny is hatred or distrust of women. That's it. And if you want to go a little more in depth, it's hatred or distrust of women because they're women. So you can hate a woman for reasons that have nothing to do with her being a woman. Like, um, that woman punched me in the nose and broke my nose. Or, that woman stole my wallet. Or, that woman told the courts falsely that I abused my children so that she could get more child support. See, these all have nothing to do with being a woman. And my distinction here is largely going to fall on that line. The scope of misogyny has expanded, much like the scope of racism has expanded. Amusingly, also contracted. <clears throat> racism is not prejudice plus power, or prejudice plus systemic power. Ultimately, racism comes down to treating someone differently on the basis of their race. Um, racism can be positive. Racism can be negative. You can treat someone better on the basis of their race. That is racist behavior. Um, I actually prefer, personally, the strict definition of racism, 
which is a belief that one race is superior to another and acting in that way. So not merely um, knowing that black people are 13% of the population yet commit 50% of the whatever crime, murder, I don't know. And thus being more guarded around a black person by default because the chances are disproportionately like what, four, four to one maybe? Yeah, something like that. Like four to one higher that um, you will, you know, potentially be attacked. That doesn't mean that a specific person does anything wrong that makes you feel that way. But if you know that the risk, just based on pure probability, is higher, then acting like the risk is higher makes sense. And it's not racist to do so. You are not assuming that because someone is a particular race that they are going to do it, but you are prepared more because the risk exists. And the race is really not the factor. Like, the race doesn't make them that way. The race is, however, a signal that you should be more on your guard for it to become that way. And it's probability, not race, that ultimately drives that. But this nuance is completely lost whenever you're dealing with some psychotic member of the blue church, the new dogma, the socially acceptable narrative. So, bringing it back to misogyny, I wanted to go into racism a bit there because you have to draw these nuanced lines if you're going to discuss the topic at all. And the problem that these people have with these nuances is that they completely demolish their bogus arguments. They do not have valid arguments because what they are saying is misogyny isn't at all misogyny. Hatred or distrust of women is not a factor, but they call it that. They call it that not because it's legitimately that, but because if they call it that, then they can exploit that call out for other means. Um, virtue signaling to show their friend groups and extended friend groups or peer groups that they that I support the thing that is correct to support. I stand up for women, fictional women in a book that don't actually exist. You know, that's often the case. It's, it's most of the time when you see someone declare something misogynist, it's performative, it's clout chasing. It, it has more to do with integrating into a social group or just not going against the perceived grain of society. It has nothing to do with actual hatred or distrust of women. The reason I wanted to bring up the racism first, though, is that racism does not have a specific race applied to it. Some people have, over time, tried to do that. Uh, traditionally, in the United States, racism is most often applied to black or Hispanic people, um, specifically referring to prejudice and discrimination against those groups. However, that doesn't mean that those groups are the definition of racism. Reverse racism does not exist. Reverse racism is a term that I don't know the origins of, but that in any modern understanding really just exists to separate the notion that racism against certain groups is racism, racism against other groups does is not actually racism. Come on, you guys, it's not really racist. Uh, but no, racism cuts all ways. It is a general term, in, and misogyny does not cut both ways. Misogyny is a gendered, specific term, referring to only one gender. Which, since there are only two genders, I don't care, fight me bro, X and Y chromosomes laugh at you. Since there are only two genders, the female gender is the one acted upon, and the male gender is the one acting upon the female. Um, that's the way that the word misogyny works. The whole point of it is to say men are bad to women. Men are the evil. Men are bad. And in fact, almost everything that you find feminism actually saying comes down to taking general terms, general concepts like being rude, being crass, being an asshole. In some way, some general concept being basically stolen and assigned a direction when the concept does not have a direction. Hatred is something that anybody can be on the receiving end of. 
prejudice, discrimination, you name it, all of these negative things, you know, rudeness. Um, it is not at all uncommon for women to talk about their sexual activities and the sexual characteristics of their present and past partners rather, um, <laughs> I would say almost worse than the majority of bros talk about how sexy women are. It's, it, it's, if you ever actually get the opportunity to listen in on women in private company talking about men, oh boy, oh boy, do they have a lot to say. And there's a whole lot of demeaning, um, they can, at, at a minimum, women are able to hold just um, right up against men with the whole rude crass thing. The, the whole treating someone, the, the fake notion of objectification, boy oh boy can women do it. But the trick is if objectification is something that is perpetrated against women by men, then it is uniquely a female victimhood. And uh, there are some people who will say, well, male objectification is a thing that happens too, and it's bad, but really it's not because it's women that are objectified. Uh, objectification is a false concept, much like misogyny, but this video is not about objectification. It's about the word misogyny. It's about the concept of misogyny. <clears throat> and misogyny doesn't really exist in the minds of most people and in the actions of most people. True hatred or distrust of women for being women, just for being a woman, um, that, that's not a very common thing. In fact, human nature itself does not lend itself towards genuine hatred or distrust of women. Because by themselves, women don't do anything that warrants such hatred or distrust. And also, people in general go with the flow so that they don't experience societal rejection, become an outcast or exiled. Um, so human nature is get along so that you don't get excommunicated and it, back in the day, early in human evolution, getting kicked out pretty much meant you were guaranteed to die. So the people who were agreeable enough to not get kicked out of the clan were the ones who survived. Therefore, why would you hate women? It's risky. It's dangerous to hate women. And we're ignoring the whole social justice thing. Just taking an entire broad brush of the population and hating them is something that humans do not naturally do. It is entirely nurture over nature. It is entirely educated. And boy, do I use the word educated really loosely. In, in the absolute loosest terms, as I do not consider teaching people to hate other people because of their immutable identity characteristics to be a very good idea or a good thing. I don't consider it teaching. I consider it corruption. I consider it cancer of some of the highest order. You should not teach people to hate other people in general based on things those people can't even control. Now, that doesn't mean that you won't have natural reactions. That doesn't mean that you won't behave based on information that arrives. You have to approach the world with heuristics. You cannot know everything. You cannot see everything. <clears throat> you have to take guesses to get through life. You have to make assumptions. You have to make decisions based upon limited available data at the time. Something tells me if I go to Harlem and I just start walking around, Eventually, at some point, I'm not going to be able to continue walking freely without a large group of probably black and or Hispanic individuals standing in my way and shaking me down. Because statistically speaking, and especially with the racial disparity, that's going to happen. It's not really an if so much as a when. Anybody who's been to a big city knows this. There are no-go zones if you are not a certain race or a certain gang affiliation. This is a thing that exists. Let's not pretend like it doesn't. But that's not even what we're talking about. We're talking about heuristics because guess what? It's fair to say that if you've, say, um, had relationships with eight women and seven of those eight women have stabbed you in the back in some really horrible, hurtful way, that there's a good chance that the next one will do the same thing. And so, yeah, you know what? 
it makes perfect sense and it is not at all some sort of um, sexist, misogynist, hateful, whatever thing for you to look at that woman and go, okay, all these others have stabbed me in the back except for one. I don't have a huge sample size. It's not like I can date 10,000 women and see if all of them stab me in the back. But based on what my experience, on what I have to go on, I'm a seven for eight on getting backstabbed. It is not remotely hateful for you to assume that the next one has a high likelihood of also stabbing you in the back, doing something bad. And yes, the fact that they are a woman and that you are dating them because that's the context is the reason that you come to that prejudice. You judge them before you know them. Now, the problem comes when you change your behavior such that you effectively sabotage the relationship. It's one thing to be prepared, it's another to be paranoid. You want to give the other person the chance to be whatever they are, but you still steal yourself for the likely possibility that you're going to get harmed. It's not unreasonable to act that way. The problem really comes when you start mistreating someone else because you're afraid they'll mistreat you. And like I've said earlier in the video, this distinction does not get drawn when you're dealing with feminists or feminist adjacent people or anybody who is not just indoctrinated into leftism, like, you know, Democrat by default, you know, big city resident, you know, West Coast, East Coast, whatever. You, you know the blue areas of the United States. You know that in those areas, there are these really unrealistic expectations on people, depictions of people. There, there's this expectation that you will not, um, you will not hate women, but by hate women, you really, it really means you will treat women differently, but in a positively discriminating way rather than negative. Um, obviously, that's bad too. Women, if, if you have a bad experience with seven out of eight women, then assuming that the next one is likely to, but not necessarily going to harm you, it makes sense, but, you know, it, you, these people would be like, oh no, you have to assume that all of them will be like the one that was good. And furthermore, the same people would be so unrealistic as to cast the other seven as well. What did you do wrong? And yeah, Usually in relationships, both people do something wrong. But note, not what did she do wrong, only what did you do wrong? Why did you make her behave that way? Why did your actions not take a path that was more conducive to get her to behave that way? Notice how it's snatching all the agency out of the women when you do this, by the way. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it funny how somehow feminists, leftists, all of them, you know, just the thing is they're all kind of in the same pot, but I'm just gonna say feminist from now on and you know what I mean when I'm referring to this particular group. There are some who may not be quite as rabid, but they're all kind of in the same pot. So it's, it's funny how feminists will either declare that women have tons of agency and power, they're strong, powerful, independent, blah, 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 but then, in a situation like this, it's like, well, I'm a man and I've been hurt by a bunch of women. Well, those women have no agency. What did you as a man do to cause the problem? Because there's no way that women cause the problem. See, it's preferential treatment. And these people who use the term misogyny, that, that's the way that they think in general. And it's not even necessarily their fault. You are what you surround yourself with. Unless you're an extremely stubborn, strong-willed person, you are what you surround yourself with. One reason I don't have many friends and I don't surround myself with many people at all is because I don't want to be surrounded by a bunch of drooling morons. So I can think clearly. I can see things clearly because I don't have idiots tainting my perspective at every single turn. But most people do not have that benefit. Most people are surrounded by a work culture, a, a, a friend culture, a neighbor culture. That There's all of these subcultures that influence your line of thought. And most people are simply stuck in this pond of influence and cannot break out of it. Even if they are presented with overwhelming information to the contrary of the things that the people around them say, they still have to play the part. 
Well, have you ever heard the phrase uh, fake it till you make it? <clears throat> That's what's going on here. A lot of people will pretend to go along with the whole women are better than men, even though we're really calling it, we're calling it equality or equity, or we're calling the behavior misogyny, even though it's not, you know, they'll go along with that line and they won't question it outwardly because it's dangerous to do so. And eventually they have to adopt the belief as their own personal worldview, a component of their actual personal identity. Not because they genuinely believed it at first or because they were convinced through intellectual debate and discussion, but because the people around them forced them to take on that belief as a core value of their identity. They were forced, they were coerced, they were beaten into submission. Oh my God, a fucking cyber truck, the ugliest thing ever created. God, and it even has ugly tires. Why would you get something like that and then put like the most redneck looking steel tires on the thing? What? Anyway, sorry, had a little bit of a cyber truck moment there. God, anybody who buys one of those, I instantly have no respect for. What? Yeah, nope, nope, all right. Sorry, Cybertruck distraction over. So that just, I just completely got intellectually derailed by a Cybertruck. What does the world come to? It's not even a truck, it's like an ugly minivan. Um, anyway, I think I saw that thing in Star Wars. Yeah, the little people came out of it in Star Wars. All right. So the crux of the issue for me is that misogyny does not mean what people think it means. And people use it to refer to things inappropriately. Now getting to the examples of things that I think have been grossly inappropriately assigned the label of misogyny, let's go back to my book. Here's Anthony, Split Infinity, which is the first book in the Apprentice Adept series. I read two chapters of it yesterday. If you go to Goodreads, you will find no shortage of middling to poor reviews. And those middling to poor reviews will tell you that the reason that they gave them, some of them seem legitimate. Okay, I read the books before. I get that bouncing between the two worlds and some of the stuff is jarring. Okay, that's your own personal perspective. I get it. You know what? You want to give it three stars because you thought the bouncing between two worlds was just a little bit poorly executed. That's cool. That's fine with me. But if you're giving it one star and saying, er, it's so misogynistic because his girlfriend is a robot or something. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that I'm not spoiling too much by saying some of this. Um, but yeah, yeah, the um, it's misogynistic because everybody on the planet's naked. Uh, and they, they're, they're serfs. They're not like slave slaves, but they're, they're basically mostly slaves. And they're naked slaves. Everybody's naked. Um, I read this book with the newfound political lens I've grown over the past two decades of watching social justice freaks tear the entirety of society into shreds and, uh, and, and make up all this BS vocabulary and fake intellectual framework to uh, support their nonsense views so that they can exploit them for clout and bully anybody who um, disagrees with them into submission. Um, but I read these two chapters and the whole time I'm thinking of feminism and all of the things that they say and all of the reviews that are like, this is misogynist and uh, let me just, you know, breasts and uh, naked people and, and dis descriptions of uh, descriptions of, of women's bodies and uh, you know, all this stuff. It's just, it's absolutely absurd. None of it makes any sense to me. Because when I actually read the book, it's not talking about any woman, even the fake one, in a hateful way. Um, there are lines in the first chapter or two, there are lines that I read and I'm like, how are feminists not praising this? I, you read some of the stuff that the female robot girlfriend whatever says the the perfect one with the with the nice breast that looks so sexy in clothes because they're naked so clothing is extremely arousing um, because they're not allowed to have much in the way of clothing so I'm reading this stuff and like the guy makes this robot um, basically forces it to tell the truth and so on and the book literally says you raped me and just goes over like the whole consent thing and the, and the guy realizes he's wrong and cries and shit. It's just, you know, there's so much that I look at it and I'm like, you know, if you take your heads out of your asses, you'd actually realize that once you can get past 
the fact that in your mind you, you hear anything about female bodies or nudity and you instantly assume that it's absolute abject hatred of females, maybe if you could just get your mind out of that moron gutter for two seconds, you'd realize there's actually a lot of progressive ideals in this book. It's amazing. It's, it's, just, it's amazing to me that it's misogyny to describe the nude female form. It's misogyny to describe that the man likes it. And, and that's the thing, is that the story's told from this guy's perspective, and his perspective is, this chick is hot. The, the, the robot girl is literally designed specifically to tailor to his unique personal interests. Like, she looks the way she does specifically to attract him. The whole point of her being built was to catch his interests specifically and hard. Like, this thing was designed to make him crush on her big time. That was the whole point. And somehow that's hatred. Somehow that's misogyny. That the robot was designed to attract him in order to achieve other goals. Oh my god, what, that's so terrible. And describing this robot female, oh, <clears throat> you know, her, her body was not muscular and lanky, um, so obviously she doesn't play the games that often because well, that's, that's, that's the way it would be. You're not going to be a big buff girl if you're occasionally playing the games. You're not going to have low body fat unless you're doing a lot of athletic stuff really often. And all of that makes sense. That world building makes sense. And it, it's, it humanizes this robot female. You know, you have to build the picture. What is this guy seeing? And the whole time that this first chapter is going on, and he's like, this woman is hot and skillful. I admire her skill. I admire her appearance. I admire her demeanor. Um, and I want to impress her. But something's off. And I don't want to spoil the book for you. I won't say any more that should spoil it. But the whole first chapter is, this woman is an amazing woman. I really like her. I really, you know, I want to impress her. Um, I'm interested very much in her, but there's something wrong and I just can't put my finger on it. So how are you supposed to describe that? How are you supposed to describe that and not be misogynistic? It's like, oh, so we're supposed to clothe the slaves so that some stupid feminist who thinks the female form is dirty, I guess, um, doesn't declare it misogynistic? Is, is that what we're supposed to do? Really? Oh, okay. That makes perfect sense. Well, you know, just, just take all the sex and nudity out of it. Why don't we write a fucking family, family-friendly sci-fi book that, take, that is fiction taking place on a different world, written from the point of view of a manlet? The dude is literally a manlet, and they say in the thing repeatedly, in the whole friggin' book, in fact, that this guy is, is much shorter than other men, and because he's shorter than other men, he, of course, has a bit of a Napoleon complex, but also that he's gone out of his way to become very good at a lot of things. Not the best. They even say in the book, they don't even make the man the best. Like, this woman robot loses, but by, like, that much. Probably even let him win so that she wouldn't, like, best him and invoke him. I just don't see how a manlet who has some confidence issues, who has some suspicions. Like, they draw this picture of this guy that's very good at the games, very well-known, but very flawed. And he's, and, and they don't even make him like, oh, well, I'm just this, uh, what is the name that, what is the thing I saw in one of those stupid reviews where it's like the male equivalent of a Mary Sue, it's like a Gary something. But they don't even do that with him. Not only do they give him all these character flaws, like right off the bat, he's got a bunch of them. But then, he's not even the best in his class. The, the robot lady is like, you hold back. You could be the best. And he's like, no, I don't think so. Um, he's like, I am holding back, but even if I do my best, uh, I'm probably still only going to be fifth or sixth in my bracket. So, hmm. um, I'm actually surprised I didn't see more people harp on the fact that there's supposed to be like a 12-year age gap between them, even though it's a robot. But yeah, um, 
All right, I have things to do. This has gone on long enough. I think you see my point. It's not misogyny to describe women. It's not misogyny to describe fictional women behaving badly. It's not hatred of women to make your fiction book have bad women in it. That's just not how that works. And guess what? Some women are bad. It is not misogyny to say that women can be bad, that women are human, women are flawed, women can behave poorly, women can hurt people, women can kill people, women can do bad things and be bad people. Um, and men can do the same. We are all flawed. We all, by default, learn by making bad mistakes and then correcting ourselves in the future. It's not unique to men or unique to women. And you know what? I'll tell you what. Take the, take the same story, if you want to, take the same story, get rid of all the nudity, all the sex, all the sex appeal, all the interpersonal relationships, because that's ultimately what it really comes down to, all of, all of the romance, all of that gone. You'll just have a sci-fi fantasy movie. I mean, it, it's basically, it basically would be a watered-down version of, like, Thor or something. Yeah, it's like Thor if he had uh, depression and impotence. That's it. Yeah, Piers Anthony should rewrite his books so that they star Thor with depression and impotence and a robot woman that beats the crap out of him but looks like a man. Mm. Hey, man, <laughs> I'm sure everybody would want to pay for that book. All right, enough of this. Like, comment, subscribe. And by the way, if you've made it this far and you're interested, I have considered reading the actual book, just making videos reading the book and discussing it in more detail. If that's something that would interest you, let me know. Um, also, that Life as a Service movie, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to have to make that. There was a lot of interest in that. So that's on the horizon, too. All right, thanks for watching. Take care.